All right, this is uh, <clears throat> Isaiah for Beginners. And the title of this uh, lesson, uh, lesson number five in our series is When Good Becomes Evil and Evil Becomes Good. And uh, we're out of the uh, part of the uh, series where we're simply explaining how Isaiah put together his book and you know, talking about literary features and devices, things like that, all very interesting to help us understand. And all of you have received the, an outline where you can follow. In other words, if you're reading Isaiah, uh, Isaiah I've given you an outline. And if some of you are missing those, I'll uh, bring some more uh, next time if you'd like to get uh, one of those outlines. Um, I said that the, the last several lessons in the series, I'm simply going to preach or teach from Isaiah. You know, Isaiah written, what, uh, 2,700 years ago. You know, does it have anything to do with us today? You know, all this archaic literary, these archaic literary devices and you know, all these things, all very interesting, I suppose. But does he have anything for us today? Is there any application at all? Here's a prophet speaking to the Jews 700 years before Christ. Yes, prophecies, uh, amazing prophecies, but what about 2021? You know, anything to say? Well, I've chosen Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Let's see uh, if uh, uh, anything Isaiah said it can be applied to the modern setting. Here he says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Now in this uh, particular verse, uh, the prophet uh, Isaiah is describing one of the sins that the Jewish people are guilty of that will ultimately lead to the destruction of the northern kingdom by the Assyrians, 720 BC thereabouts, and later on to the destruction of the southern kingdom by the Babylonian empire in 586 uh, BC. Now this was not the only sin mentioned in this passage. In this passage, if we were to continue reading, he talks about the abuse of alcohol, uh, immoral revelry, uh, dishonesty and corruption in public life, arrogance before God. These things were serious enough, but in verse 20, Isaiah describes not just a sinful act, but rather the level of sinfulness that the nation had arrived at. Not just some of the bad things that they were doing, but the, you know, the level of evil that they had arrived at. They were so wicked, he says, and proud that they celebrated and promoted what was essentially evil, and they restricted and labeled what was traditionally good as being evil. They just turned everything around. And his point is, this is how bad this nation has become. Isaiah was telling the people that they had completely reversed the moral order and that God would punish them for this. Now, it wasn't simply that they failed to obey or comply to God's moral order. I mean, nothing new here. People have always failed to obey God's commands, not like there was anything new about that. What was new was the attempt to actually change the order itself so that sinfulness was now considered acceptable and holiness and faith and obedience were to be rejected. That's what he's talking about. Isaiah was warning them that once they headed down this road, the only result would be destruction. Destruction because if they completely rejected God's moral order and created one of their own, they would no longer be of any use to him as his chosen people. 
trying but failing to obey God's commands left them depending on God's mercy and strength for life and salvation. And of course, this was acceptable to God. He's, he's uh, you know, had always offered his mercy to his people because he knew that they were weak and you know, even if they tried to do what was right and good, they often failed. So that was, that was normal. You know, failing to do what was right that, that, that was you know, within the norms, so to speak. But actually changing the moral order, that was something new. Making up and following their own laws, their own moral framework would, and as history shows, did lead to a complete destruction of their nation. Now, we don't use that term anymore, you know, calling you know, evil good and good evil. We don't use that term anymore. Today we have much more subtle ways of deconstructing the moral order set by God in His word. We say things like, well, love is what matters. Love is what matters, the only thing that matters. Or we say every lifestyle deserves respect. Or we say things like, we must guarantee everyone's rights. Or we talk about uh, defending gender equality and marriage equality, uh, a woman's right to choose. My personal favorite, uh, you don't want to be on the wrong side of history, do you? Meaning, uh, you want to keep up with the new order of things, don't you? That's what I see in newspapers and magazines and articles. Now don't get me wrong, these terms are legitimate in themselves. I mean, love does matter and we must respect everyone and this idea is often guaranteed by law. So those things are legitimate in, in themselves. But these terms have been hijacked by godless ideologues who use them to recreate the moral order of our day into something that would have been unrecognizable to most Americans 75 years ago and contrary to God's word in any generation. I don't need to drag out a laundry list of social ills that plague our nation to make my point here. I'll only use one example to serve uh, and represent all the rest. On June the 26th, uh, 2015, the Supreme Court, and this is a picture of the Supreme Court in 2015, uh, the Supreme Court in a five to four decision made marriage between two men or two women the law in all 50 states. I don't have the time to list all of the twisted arguments and political pressure and likely fallout from this ruling in you know, a 30 minute class. Suffice to say that American society, groomed by decades of morally decadent entertainment, misinformed by a secular news media and educational system, and brainwashed by a, a wealthy and politically well-connected gay lobby actually uh, bought into the ridiculous premise that two men or two women should be able to marry each other with all the rights and privileges that heterosexual couples have. We actually bought into this idea to the point where the highest court in the land enshrined this idea into law. And so it was the law of the land. Now, I say ridiculous because the one basis that all cultures and all religions throughout history have agreed on is that marriage is the best environment or relationship to have in order to produce children. I say ridiculous because this is the only thing that gay couples cannot naturally do. They can marry, 
even if the court says, you know, that's a legitimate and legal thing, they can do that. They can have sex. Uh, uh, they can build a house together. They can live together for a hundred years. And yes, they can even love one another. I don't deny that, but they cannot naturally produce a child, which is the essential human, moral, social reason for marriage in the first place. Now, I could say immoral and unbiblical and unchristian and defend each of those arguments, but I say ridiculous because gay marriage should never have passed this very lowest bar of credibility. But five lawyers, who embody the entire social and intellectual waste of this generation's foolish thinking, decided to change the moral order set by God and followed by all men for thousands of years. Five people decided to change that. Now Isaiah spoke of these when he said, and I quote here, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Everyone celebrated this idea. Wow, we are so modern, we are so ahead, so advanced in our thinking. Finally, you know, we're so progressive, we're seeing the light. We're getting out of you know, the dark ages where only men and women uh, can legally marry. The three women and the two men on the Supreme Court who voted for this have now enshrined in law a new standard for what is right and what is wrong when it comes to not only marriage, but to sexual expression as well. Brothers and sisters, I'm not the one to predict the end of this nation or that time. You know, God decides these type of things. I'm not that type of preacher you know, that talks about end times, you know, tries to figure out when Jesus is coming. That's not what I do. But when I saw a picture of the White House lit up in the rainbow colors of the gay pride movement on the front page of the USA Today newspaper, I knew that something profound had taken place in our country and there's no going back to where we once were. Now, the proponents of same-sex marriage from the president, and it was the president at that time, all the way to the president in the present era, to the judges and most news and entertainment personalities, they love to warn Christians that we're, you know, we're on the wrong side of history in this, in this matter. They uh, compare the ruling uh, to the emancipation of the slaves after the Civil War or the right to vote for women. They say this is the same thing as that. Their argument is that those who are against same-sex marriage today are like the ones who were for slavery in the past or those who didn't want women to have the right to vote. And they kind of throw everybody in the same boat. Talk about the wrong side of history. This accusation coming from people who have ignored and perverted history in order to force their fake civil rights agenda down the throats of the uninformed and gullible nation. The diabolic cleverness of their argument is that they are correct in stating the fact that not allowing gay couples to marry is discrimination. For example, not allowing marriage between black and white people, this is discrimination. Or not allowing a woman to vote because she is a woman, this is discrimination. Or paying a handicapped accountant less than a non-handicapped accountant, this is discrimination. So in this sense, they have a correct way to argue their case. For example, if a man and a woman can marry, well, they say it's discrimination not to let two men or two women marry. 
That's the thinking. After all, they're consenting adults who love each other. Now don't get me wrong, I said that they found a correct way to argue their case, an argument based on the principle of civil and human rights, but the argument itself is false. For example, civil or human rights protection are given to those who are by nature or by some event brought into a certain condition or status. In other words, a situation or status over which you have no choice. For example, you're born or you become handicapped in such a way, in some way. Or uh, your gender, you're born female or you're born male, or you're born into a certain culture. These are things that you have no control over. And there are legal protections set in place so that you're not abused or discriminated against just because you're a woman or because you're black or because you're handicapped in some way. These are just and right laws, of course. For many years, homosexuals tried to gain acceptance for their lifestyle by using the scientific argument that you know, they were just born that way. It was just genetics, they say, that caused me to be gay. They touted research, and I put in bracket, much of it done by gay researchers. They touted research that suggested that there might be a link between homosexual behavior and biology. The problem was that they never found the genetic silver bullet that proved that there actually was a gay gene. And if you had it, you would automatically be disposed to homosexuality. They argued that, but they never proved it. Now, the strongest argument against the gay gene theory was the result of the famous twins research. And here I'm going to read from the report. So I read from the report, I'm quoting now. Eight major studies of more than 10,000 sets of identical twins during the last two decades all arrive at the same conclusion. Gays were not born that way. At best, genetics is a minor factor, says Dr. Neil Whitehead, PhD in biochemistry and statistics. Identical twins have the same genes or DNA and they are nurtured in equal prenatal conditions. In other words, twins are nurtured inside the same woman's uh, uh, stomach, okay? Therefore, if homosexuality is caused by genetics or prenatal condition, and one twin is gay, then the co-twin should also be gay. If both twins are not gay, then homosexuality cannot be genetically dictated. The predominant things that create homosexuality in one identical twin and not in the other have to be post-birth Factors. In other words, it happened after you were born. Same sex attraction, what is commonly known as homosexuality, is caused by non-shared factors. In other words, things that happen to one twin, but not the other, or a personal response to an event by one of the twins and not the other. Now, that's a quote I've just read from the, the report. You see what the report says? 10,000 sets of twins studied over 20 years. And researchers have found uh, that you know, uh, they either have to both be gay or not gay, but one twin that's gay and the other that's not gay, that can't happen. It never has happened, why? because they have the same genes. And if there's, a, if there's a gay gene, then the twin study would have demonstrated that when you've got the gay gene, both twins would have it. And it proved that it didn't work that way. 
This is just one of many scientific studies that concluded that genetics had very little or no effect on same-sex attraction. The consensus continues to be the same-sex attraction develops when a person is exposed to various experiences and situations as they grow up. Some, but not all, some of the factors are the following. Uh, homes, for example, that have no father or that have a very dominant mother and a weak father. Um, early exposure to pornography, especially gay pornography. Um, sexual or physical abuse. Uh, Same-sex experimentation during puberty. A sexual confusion or sexual identity that is not addressed. A, permi a permissive society that actually encourages this uh, type of lifestyle. These are some of the factors, not that I've come up with, uh, that the research has come up with, that determine if an individual uh, will act out or live out uh, their same sex uh, uh, attraction. Not everyone who experiences these things here that I mentioned becomes gay, it's not automatic, but many of these factors are present in the lives of those who experience same sex attraction. So seeing that the scientific argument was going nowhere, the gay movement switched tactics and they began a push to find legitimacy using human and civil rights arguments. In other words, they cast themselves as victims of discrimination and they tied their wagon to the American civil rights movement and pressured government using this new approach. The scientific approach wasn't working and so they used the civil rights approach. This is why I say that the way that they argue is effective. It managed to convince news outlets and courts and even presidents and public opinion. But the substance of their argument was false. And here's why. To achieve the status of discrimination or to uh, discriminated against minority, to achieve that status, one has to show that their condition is due to one or more of the following factors. One, genetics. In other words, race or gender or handicap, something you have no control over. If you're discriminated against because your eyes are blue, you, you have no control over that. Uh, and so th there should be laws to protect you know, people who have blue eyes. Um, events. In other words, uh, you're, you're, you're injured in an accident and you, 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 know, you become handicapped in some way. You lose your ability because of, to do things or to work because of, a, of an illness. Uh, this puts you in a minority and there should be laws to protect you, to make sure that you're, you, know, you have opportunities to, to work. And then the third one is condition. In other words, if you're black and poor, or if you're an ex-convict, or if you're an immigrant. You know, there are laws that protect people in these categories. But homosexuals fail to qualify in any of these categories. In other words, homosexuality is not the result of genetics. This is not just my opinion. This is scientific fact. Uh, no one forces one to become gay. It's a condition that evolves slowly, mostly based on experience and environment and decision-making. Uh, and groups are not, uh, or gays rather, are not a downtrodden minority needing protection. They do and have uh, uh, wielded more influence than any other group that at most comprises of about 2% of the population. I mean, the amount of political uh, power wielded by the gay lobby is, is uh, amazing. So the point I'm making is that gays 
have won a significant legal victory by successfully using a false argument to make same-sex marriage possible in all 50 states. So when they say, you don't want to be on the wrong side of history, do you? Uh, this is just shorthand. It's a shorthand way of, of, of tying their cause with the civil rights movement and casting those who disagree as racists or prejudiced or narrow-minded relics of the past. Don't be fooled by their slippery rhetoric and false arguments. Now here's the question. Well, first of all, you know, I'm talking about this subject to demonstrate um, uh, how applicable uh, Isaiah's prophecies are to our generation today. In a sense, that's what we've done. That's what's happened in our day. What was evil not very long ago and had been evil for generations has now become good. And what was good and righteous has now become evil. What I'm doing right now is considered evil uh, by our society because I am speaking up against uh, gay marriage and you know, all the rest of it. Uh, the big question, however, is so where do we, you know, what do we do now? The question among Christians is, now that the ruling of the court has come down, where to now? How do we change this ruling? What kind of laws should we create to protect churches and ministries and Christian institutions like schools and colleges against lawsuits and other attacks? Many colleges, you know, many Christian universities today uh, have fallen victim uh, to this uh, type of thinking as well. And they don't want to be on the wrong side of history. And so they're beginning to accommodate, uh, not, not rebuke, not rebuke this lifestyle. They're beginning to accommodate this lifestyle on their campuses. Something I thought I'd never see in my lifetime, but it's beginning to happen. So I suppose the, th these things need to be considered, but for most of us Christians who are not lawyers or responsible for Christian-based organizations, what do we do in the face of this change in the moral order of our country? Well, here are some suggestions. Number one, stop being surprised and discouraged at what an unbelieving and unregenerated world does. Why should we be surprised at what the world does? You know, what does Peter, the apostle, say about this in chapter four of his uh, epistle, first epistle? He says, therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles, having pursued a course of sensuality, lusts, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. In all of this, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you, but they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. From the beginning, the church has been at odds with the world. Uh, Peter is reminding his readers of the status quo that existed then and continues until now and was even present in the days of Isaiah. There's nothing new here. There's nothing new here. Disappointed, yes. Disgusted, yes. Discouraged, yes. Surprised, no. No, not surprised. What did you think would happen when the Supreme, Supreme Court refused to hear or give credit to any argument for traditional marriage based on the Bible? In other words, the lawyers who were defending 
the idea of traditional marriage and were you know, against the idea of legalizing same-sex marriage, those lawyers, when they went before the court to make their case, they could base their arguments on any information they wanted except the Bible. They were forbidden to use the scriptures as the basis of their argument. So you could argue your case from any point of view except from the Bible's point of view. In this world, there is only discouragement and turmoil. Don't let that reality get you down. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 16, in the world, you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Here's another suggestion. Stop worrying about the decline of the world. It's normal. It's just a normal thing. Brothers and sisters, stress over the decline of morality or values and conduct in this world and the latest you know, pandemic, uh, that belongs to unbelievers. They worry if their grandchildren will be able to survive. The moral condition of the world goes up and it goes down. It's a cycle. There were times that were terrible. Uh, the time of the Roman Empire, uh, the Middle Ages. And then there were times that were relatively speaking good. You know, America after World War II. But the pendulum swings between the two extremes and will continue to do so until Jesus returns. Let's read carefully what he says. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. What is the Lord telling us? It's just going to keep going round and round and round and round and round and round and it'll stop all of a sudden. The thing to be concerned about is not the condition of an unbelieving wicked world. No, the thing to focus on is our own readiness. Unlike the world, we know that Jesus is coming and we know how to be ready for Him. Interesting, he says, you know, until Noah entered the ark, they're still laughing while Noah is entering the ark. Look at this idiot, he's getting, they got the animals on the boat. Where does he think he's going? And then, is that rain I feel? <laughs> they still didn't get it. Even when they got on the ark, they still didn't get it. The Bible has already told us that the world will not be ready, that the world will be caught by surprise. No need to stress out over that. Just make sure that you're ready. That's your job, that's my job. One last suggestion, stop being surprised and worried. Stop stressing over the world's decline. Number three, Stop trying to fix the world. There are any number of organizations who are trying to fix the environment, fix the poor, fix immigrants, fix the rights of women and gays and black lives matter. They're out to fix everything. I'm not saying that these and other efforts are wasted or not worthy. Well, Christianity needs to affect the world in a positive and constructive way, like salt, like light, Jesus says. But these things do not achieve our primary goal as a church, which is the salvation of souls. Jesus didn't tell us to go out and fix the world. He told us to call all people to come 
out of the world and into the kingdom of God, which is the church. That's our task. So many churches have gotten so busy trying to fix the world, they've forgotten what the original task was, and that was to call people uh, with the gospel of Jesus Christ to come out of the world. I like to say, uh, tell people, hey, you know what? The building, is in, the building is on fire, get out. Save yourself. We can't save the world. It is already set for destruction when Jesus comes. We can only provide the means to escape the world and the sure destruction that it will suffer. And the means to save the world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no fixing the world. There's just coming out of the world. In closing, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the wrong side of history. The history being written by this unbelieving generation. Just like Noah was on the wrong side of history for a hundred years, just like Isaiah, who largely spoke of things that few, if any, of his generation understood. Just like Jeremiah, who was ignored for most of his life and ministry. Just like Jesus, who was seemingly silenced for three days and three nights. But brothers and sisters, I would rather be on the wrong side of history written by man than the wrong side of God and what is written in his book of life. And so I say to you, let's not be discouraged and let's not be afraid. This may be a time of testing and pruning for the church, for ourselves and for our faith. Uh, I say to you, I say to you, this COVID business, it'll be over and uh, you know, we'll get a, another leader of our nation in a couple of years, you know, and things will change. You know, and, and, and you're going to ask yourself one day, back in 2020 and 2021, during you know, the COVID and the storm and the, all the stuff and all the bad stuff, how did I perform as a Christian? How did I perform as a Christian while the testing was on? While God tested the nation? How did I perform as a Christian? Did I run around worried and confused and afraid? Is that, was that my reaction? Don't be discouraged. Don't compromise what we know to be true about marriage from God's word. We need to find ways to anticipate or rather articulate this without being mean-spirited or angry. Much of what turns people against us is not simply our Bible teaching, it's our self-righteous and mean-spirited attitude at times. Not always, but at times. Many times, Homosexuals cannot see Christ in us, and so it makes it easy for them to reject Christ because of us. It's the old story of being able to love the sinner no matter what his or her sin is. And let's be about the Father's business, shall we? not fixing the world or being discouraged by the sin in the world, but rather preaching the good news to the world. If we're busy doing this, we won't be burdened by the other things. Isaiah has gone before us, uh, warning that uh, there would be times when evil would be considered good and good would be considered evil. Well, brothers and sisters, we are living in those times. We as Christians know what to do. Let's just get busy and do what we know 
God has given us to do. Well, that's our lesson on Isaiah this morning. We'll continue uh, trying to draw out other lessons from uh, various passages of Isaiah uh, for the next couple of weeks. Good, our class is over, we're dismissed. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>